Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to River Church Online Worship. I'm Pastor Randy Caulfield, and I'm so delighted that you've invited me into your home today. In just a few minutes, we're going to get started, but I want to encourage you, first of all, to go get your communi communion elements, bread and uh, juice, because we will be celebrating communion in a moment. Go get your Bible and something to write with, and I'm going to give you some thoughts that you're going to want to write down. Uh, and get rid of uh, any distractions. Uh, maybe fill up your coffee cup. I want you to know that if you have any questions about River Church, all things River Church can be found at uh, riverchurchrgv.com at our website. Uh, anything, everything you need to know about that, about the church can be found there. So uh, get your stuff ready and we'll get rolling in just a minute. This is week four of our study, Escaping the Lion's Den, a study of God's faithfulness in the book of Daniel. And it's relevant to our lives because many of us right now feel as though we're living in the lion's den of adversity. It may be for you financial or emotional or relational, uh, but, but you feel like you're, you're trapped. And like Daniel, who escapes from the lion den, lion's den, you want to do the same. What I want you to know this morning is that as you live in this period of adversity, the, the Lord is right there with you. He is in the lion's den. He is fighting for you. He cares about what you care about, the adversity that you feel that you're experiencing. He carries that weight for you. Like a good daddy cares about what his children care about, the Lord cares about your concerns as well. So it's good, it's appropriate that we study this, this story of, of Daniel because next week, week five, he actually escapes the lion's den. But these, these five weeks, the context of this, this uh, Daniel, the story of Daniel, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, the context is that the nation of Israel goes through 70 really tough years, seven decades of captivity, uh, first to the kingdom of Babylon and, and then to Persia. This week, in this week's study, the the, the, the reins of, of authority uh, on a global level are handed over. Uh, Babylon is, is laid uh, to waste and Persia rises up and, and a new king takes over. over. We've, we've been looking at King uh, Nebuchadnezzar for the last three weeks. This week, uh, this, this, uh, a new king takes over. Uh, only briefly, but he takes over. Uh, so the, the context is this. This 70 tough years, and the characters are Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, King Nebuchadnezzar, and now this week, King Belshazzar, his son, is the king that follows. <clears throat> and uh, and these, these four young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 15-year-old uh, boys, that are, that are taken from their homeland, Jewish boys, taken out of the nation, out of Israel, <clears throat> hauled off to captivity, into captivity in Babylonia. And because they're, because they're handsome, they're good looking boys and they're smart boys, uh, they're as slave boys, they're taken into the king's court. They're fed good food, they're well educated, that they might one day uh, be counselors in the court. Uh, and then that ultimately happens. Uh, they, they do grow up strong and wise and handsome, and they are esteemed in the king's court. So that's sort of the backdrop, uh, the recurring theme. Uh, if you've been listening to these sermons, you know this, but the, the recurring theme throughout the book of Daniel is God's sovereignty over human affairs. In other words, everything that happens in our lives, God is he's ruler, uh, he's, he's, he's in control, he's powerful, over COVID-19, uh, over the darkest days in your life, uh, the Lord, he is sovereign over it all. So five cool stories. This is week four. Uh, and in every situation, we see God's hand in it all. So this week, week four, I've entitled this the handwriting on the wall, the handwriting on the wall. And you'll, you'll see why in just a moment. Before we jump into the reading, let me ask you, in your home, do you have any special uh, sort of uh, a goblet or, or plates or dishes, china, dinnerware, a crystal, uh, that, that you only bring out on special occasions. Do you have anything like that? Special utensils that you bring out, but, but only, only on those special occasions. Not for common use, not for everyday use. 
Well, the nation of Israel, they had, they had gold and silver utensils and plates and bowls and cups and uh, all, this, all these, these special uh, utensils that were used in their temple uh, for their worship, of very sacred objects that they would only use in these religious festivals in their temple worship. Sacred objects. With that in mind, let's, let's jump right in. Daniel chapter 6, it says this. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. It's a feast for a thousand people. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem. Um, he, king Belshazzar commanded that those things be brought, uh, that the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So his father, King Nebuchadnezzar, had taken them from the temple, but now King Belshazzar brings them out to be used. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods, little g, the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. Immediately, uh, the fingers of a human hand, like a ghost hand, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote on the wall in the plaster. Then the king's color changed, his complexion, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together, a, a sure sign that he is really scared. Okay, let's stop right there. Here's what we know. From history, what we know is that, that, that on this occasion, when King Belshazzar is throwing this great feast, just outside the city walls uh, is the Persian army. They're camping out there, uh, waiting patiently to ransack the city. What an odd time to have a feast. The, what we also know is that Babylon had in recent days suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of Persia. And, and Babylon would in just a very short time fall to Persia. Thus would end the Neo-Babylonian period of rule uh, around the known world. Now Persia would rule the known world. So again, what an odd time for such a lavish banquet. What's it about? Perhaps to build morale? Uh, per, 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 perhaps, uh, perhaps a hasty coronation. Uh, well, the reason I say that is that Belshazzar perhaps was not the king until this moment in time. You see, a previous ruler had uh, died only 50 miles away uh, at the hands of the Persian army. And so perhaps uh, this was a hasty coronation where Belshazzar was grabbing, grabbing the, the kingdom. Um, or, or another option, perhaps this was just one final orgy in anticipation of certain defeat and certain death. Um, it is safe to say that the king was quite intoxicated because we know from history that, that in the Orient, there in, the, there in the, the Orient, the Middle East, that these, these foreign kings, uh, they wouldn't have done such a thing. They, they wouldn't have defamed religious articles, uh, the, 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 the silver and the gold. They would not have, have done that. Uh, even, even an unknown religion, even a foreign god, they would have been too afraid to mess with foreign gods. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, King Belshazzar's dad, he, he, had, uh, he had taken the gold and the silver goblets and the gold and silver utensils from the temple, but he didn't defame them. He merely took them and put them in a warehouse for safe keeping. But now 
Belshazzar has brought them out to flaunt his own royalty uh, and to, uh, to uplift, make much of the pagan gods of Babylon and to make fun of or to downplay Yahweh, the God of the nation of Israel. Why does he do this? Uh, well, no doubt this was an act of, of propaganda, uh, attempting to build up his citizens' confidence, confidence in our own gods, uh, our own gods, the gods of Babylon. They are superior over the God of the Bible, who he did not know, who, did, who, who he, King Belshazzar, did not revere, Yahweh, the God of the Bible. And remember, again, the, the Persian army <laughs> camping outside the gates, literally or figuratively knocking on their door at that very moment. So we have drunkenness, we have immorality and hard party, partying, and then, and then this mysterious hand and the handwriting on the wall. See, the walls were white uh, gypsum or plaster, chalky, and they could, they could have easily held the tracings of this mysterious hand, this mysterious finger, for all to see. And so uh, verses 7 through 16, we're not going to read, but here's what happens. The king is frightened. His knees are knocking together, uh, and, and he offers a great reward. He says that, that whoever can, can uh, read what's on the wall and, and, and tell me what it means, interpret what it means, uh, that, that this person uh, who can interpret the meaning of the mysterious handwriting on the wall, I will make him the third highest ranking member in all of our, in all of our nation, in all of our kingdom. Now, it's not such a big deal because the kingdom is about to fall, but, but he says, I'll make this person third in command and I will, I will give him great riches. Now, I, from the reading, I personally believe that, that everyone in the room could read the words on the wall. I just don't think they knew what, it, what they meant. They needed a man like Daniel to interpret. Let's continue on. Daniel 6, verse 17. It says, Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, uh, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. You remember from last week, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, remember that story? He had kind of a rough period where he did not honor and revere the Lord, but he learned his lesson. And ultimately, he humbled himself before the Lord. That's King Nebuchadnezzar. Now his son, King Belshazzar, as we were talking about today, Daniel goes on and says, And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lord, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, do not hear, do not know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Um, then from his presence, the hand was, was sent and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, mene, tekel, and parsing. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Peres, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So that's what, that's what the writing on the wall said and meant. King, you're toast. You're done. Then Belshazzar gave the command and, and Daniel was clothed with purple uh, and a chain of gold was put around his neck. In other words, he, was, he, he gave him what he, what he told him he would give him. And a proclamation was made about him that he would be the, 
third ruler in the kingdom. But that didn't last long, apparently, because this last verse says, that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62, year old, 62 years old. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. All right. So, what happens is, the king lost his kingdom. Why? Because he had profaned the holy. He had profaned the holy. Do you know what that means, to profane the holy? We'll, 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 we'll put the definition up here. It means that to treat something with disrespect or irreverence, to treat something that is actually sacred or holy, to treat it as though it's not sacred, it's not holy, it's common to treat it with disregard and irreverence. So, so to treat the holy is common, to profane the holy. How do we profane the holy? Now, I remember when I was a little boy, I was told, like, you never wear a hat in church, don't run in the church or be loud in the church because this is the house of God. How do we profane the holy? I remember uh, just this summer, uh, Lydia and the kids and I, we took a trip to New Orleans and we went to the St. Louis Cathedral, the Catholic Cathedral. It's a beautiful building and I love seeing beautiful buildings and all the art indoors and outdoors. But what I didn't realize or what I forgot was I had a head on a hat. And, and at one point, one of the leaders there in the, it was kind of like a museum, but they, it, this person came up to me and told me I needed to take my hat off. And I was so embarrassed because I wasn't trying to be rude. I wasn't trying to profane the holy. I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. Uh, I, I hate it when I'm misunderstood. I hate it when, when people think that my motives are ill when they're not. So I was embarrassed and I felt bad. And, 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 and that person was, say, was saying that I was profaning the holy. But is that true? What does God consider holy these days? In, in our day, dishes, candlesticks, buildings? You know, because of what Jesus has done on the cross to redeem you, to make you new again, to buy you back out of your sin and forgive you, make you whole, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, the Bible says that you are now holy. You are now sacred and, and precious in God's sight. And so if there is a, a precious object that God values that could be profaned, um, it would be you, because you are a child of the living God, a son of the living God, a daughter of the living God. You are holy. You are now considered blameless, perfect, and precious in his sight. Let me show you that. You have been bought with a price and made holy. That's what 1 Corinthians 6 says. It says, or do you not know that you, or that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you, whom you have, have from God, you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. So glorify God in your body, literally, in how you use your body. You, you've been bought with a price. The Bible also tells us that you are now a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. Maybe you feel old and, and broke down or, or used and abused, but the beauty of, bec of becoming or coming into communion with Christ, becoming a Christ follower, the beauty of that is that, that now you are made new, spotless, clean, a new creation, no longer defined by all the sin and muck that you used to live in, but you're now a new creation. You're holy, you're blameless, you're precious in God's sight. First Peter 1 says this, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his Spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have, you have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Christ. That's what Jesus did on the cross for you. He made you holy, precious in God's sight, clean. 
forgiven, sinless. You're holy. You're, you're precious. You're, you're bought with a price. You're a child of the living God. You are, you are, you are now that thing that is set apart for special use. It used to be goblets and bowls and, and dishes, but now it's you. Um, it, it used to be candlesticks and, and altars and, and buildings, but now it's you, dear son, dear, dear daughter of the living God. And so what are we to do with such good news? That now I'm holy and precious. Now you are set apart for special occasions. What does that even mean? What, we are, it means that we are to live like we are who God says we are. We are we're to be ready and, and prepared for God's special use, God's special plans for us, all the special occasions that he has dotted our lives with now as Christ followers. Uh, it's best described actually in 1 Timothy chapter 2. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It says this, now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but there are also vessels of wood and clay. Some, I suppose the vessels of gold and silver, are some are for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. First First uh, Timothy chapter 2. Okay, so now what is this saying? The picture here is, is the, the, the master, the owner of a house, I suppose it's a great big pal palatial sort of a spread. He has one room that I will call the pantry and which he keeps all of his utensils, all of his vessels. And, and he goes into that that pantry on special occasions when when a party or a banquet's coming and he looks around and he looks for the, the 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 item that he needs that will that will suit the occasion perfectly an item for honorable use he's looking for something that's special and clean and and shiny and he he takes that vessel down and he says ah this will do and the picture here, my friends, is that, that God is this master of this palatial spread. And then when he walks into the pantry, he sees us. And he reaches out and he grabs you off the shelf and he says, ah, this will do. This, this special occasion, this special vessel of mine will serve well. Just the right, just the right object for just the right opportunity. And that's you, my friend. God wants to, God wants to uh, time and time again, come and say, I've got this special event, this special moment in time, and you are the perfect person for the job. This, this, you're just right. But the warning here is that we want to be ready. When the master of the household comes in, we want to be cleaned up. We want to be honorable. We want to be prepared. We, we want him to, to reach, reach and, and pull us off the shelf and say, this is just the right vessel for this moment in time. So the idea is, no more messing around. No more wasting my life. And so what I want to talk about now in this next section is, what am I to do? In light of this picture that, that, that I am a, a, a holy vessel, I am precious in God's sight. He wants to, to use me uh, in supernatural ways for special occasions, for honorable causes. What does that mean in my life? What does that mean in your life? What, what are we to do with such beautiful truth? Okay, so what am I to do? How am I to respond to such a, an amazing concept? 
that, that I am now this sacred vessel that God wants to use time and time again for very special purposes. What am I to do? Well, write this down. We have two ideas. The first is this. I want to see myself as God sees me. I want you to see yourself as God sees you, as a precious child. Maybe you've had a hard week. And maybe, maybe somebody's told you that you're not worth much. Maybe you've had a hard life. And people have told you you're not worth much. You see, the God, the God of the universe, he has reached down from heaven via Jesus Christ's work on the cross, and he has made you special. He has, he has purpose-built you for special occasions. He wants to use you at this banquet that he is throwing uh, called life. He wants to use you time and time again in the best sense of the word. He's throwing this banquet, and, and he wants you to be the holy, honored, honorable vessel He's got, he's got some great purpose and plan for you. And so, so what we're going to do is we're going to say this. I'm not going to mess around with my life anymore. I'm not just going to piddle away at my life anymore. No, no more wasting time. If God has a purpose for me, God has a plan for me, then I want to prepare myself. Is the Holy Spirit preparing me for this? Yes. But does this passage also call for me to prepare myself? It does. It says, it says that if, if you... Uh, if you clean yourself up, prepare yourself, cleanse yourself, and then, then the Lord, he'll walk into the pantry and he'll find you ready, able. So, so, so I'm going to say, I'm going to prepare myself for, for when the master decides to, to, to come into the pantry and grab me off the shelf for any good work, for every good work, for special occasions, for, for the task at hand, for whatever it is that he has prepared me for, I want to be ready. I don't want to be asleep at the wheel. I don't want to just be video gaming my life away. I want to be ready. God says, you are not my servants anymore. That's what Galatians 4, 7. He says, you're not my servants. You're my children. Be, be, be ready as my children. Be be." Be, be waiting, anticipating that daddy's coming home and, and he's got a good work for you. In, in John 8, Jesus refers to the devil as the father of lies. And, and the devil does. He lies to you all the time. He tells you you're not worth much. Uh, you're just a slave. Uh, you're worthless. Uh, the Lord doesn't think much of you. Ah, but the truth of Scripture is he does. He sees you as a precious child, not a servant, not a slave, a precious child. And so he, he comes into that pantry and he's looking for you, ready to use you for some special occasion. You want to say, hey, Daddy, I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm all cleaned up. I, I've been waiting. I, I know that you have a purpose for me. Use me in the best sense of the word. I want to be available. I want to be useful. John 8, verses 34, beginning with verse 34, says this. Jesus said, I assure you that everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A, a slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the Son of Man has set you free, you will be free indeed. That's what a son the daughter of our Heavenly Father is, he's free. He's not a slave. He's not a slave to his sins. He's not dogged down by all of the, 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 the sin of the world and all the junk that he used to live in, that she used to live in. No, now we're free. We've, we, we live above all of that. We're forgiven. We're children, precious children. The first idea is that I'm going to see myself as God sees me. And the second big idea here is this. You're invited this morning to abide in Jesus. What does that mean? To, to, to live in the presence and the power of Jesus. To just, just, to just take moments and days and lengthy periods of time in which we just, we just dwell in the presence of Jesus. 
in prayer time, in silence, in, 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 in moments where no one else is around. We just, we, just, we just sit and soak up the presence of Jesus. John 15, Jesus says this, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, there's that word, and, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart, me, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you abide in me, Jesus says, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so, do I, so have I loved you. Did Jesus really just say that? He just said that, that, that the way that the Father loves the Son, our Heavenly Father loves Jesus Christ, in that manner, Jesus loves us. He says, so abide in my love. What does that look like? To, to, to abide in Jesus. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no use at all. It's the Spirit who gives life. The, all the trying and all the doing and all the striving and all the rule keeping, it's the Spirit who gives us life. So what do we do? We, we, we abide in Jesus. We, we meditate on Jesus. We, we spend moments of quietness and solitude. And, and we say, Jesus, I want you to, 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 to live in me, to, to flow through me. So we've got these, these grand metaphors, right? We've got this one metaphor that, that we're like a, a, a vessel for honorable use. And we want the master to come and say, ah, perfect. This is the one. This is the one I had in mind. Perfect. I've got a plan for this one. And we've got this other metaphor, which is the, the, the child to his daddy. And, and, and it's really more than a metaphor. We really are children of, the heavenly, of our Heavenly Father. And we've got a, a third metaphor, and that is like we're like branches, and Jesus is the vine. And, and in, every, in every instance, what's going on here is I'm not the powerhouse. I'm not the source of energy. I'm not the one that's getting it done. It's the Heavenly Father who takes me off the shelf and says, I've got a plan for this, this guy. It's our Heavenly Father who says, you're my child and, and, and I've got good plans for you. It's Jesus Christ himself who says, I'm the branch. I'm going to, you abide in me. I'm going to, all the energy is going to flow out of me through you. You're the branch. I'm the vine, Jesus says. You're the branch and, and you will bear much fruit. In all three of those pictures, the, the idea is, I'm not the powerful one. I'm, I'm just the recipient of all all that the Holy Spirit has for me. So in conclusion today, what I would say gently is that some of us are, are profaning the holy. We're looking at what God calls holy, what God has already made holy, and we're saying unholy. That's you, dear child of God. You were holy. You were precious. You were forgiven. Are you, are you profaning the holy in yourself today? Perhaps God uh, looks at you with, with, with his favor and his smile and you don't even see it. Perhaps you're harder on yourself than the Lord is. You are precious in his sight. You are, you are a, an honorable vessel made for, for some good use. Dwell in that. Rest in that. Receive that this morning. Amen. The truth is that, that, that sometimes we beat ourselves up. Call myself a loser. Call myself dumb. Don't think I've accomplished much. It's not how the Lord sees you at all. It's not how God sees you. He sees you as his precious child. And that all, that all came to be because of what Jesus did on the cross. You, you, you were a sinner. You, you, you didn't deserve God's grace. But Jesus changed all that 
when he went to the cross and he, he bore my sins, he paid the price that I rightly owed. And so now I'm off the hook. I'm forgiven, but more than just forgiven, I'm made new. I've received the righteousness of Christ. And that's how God sees you and me, as righteous, as holy, as sacred, as precious. And that was done on the cross. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he held up the bread and he held up the cup. And he said, from now on, when you do this, remember me. He broke the bread, he gave thanks, he ate and his disciples ate. And he said, this is my body, broken for the forgiveness of your sins. Then he took the cup, he blessed it, he gave thanks, he drank it, and his disciples drank. And he said, this is my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. When you do this, Jesus says, remember me. So that's what we do, Jesus, with heads held high. We celebrate you. You were no victim, you were a conqueror. You conquered sin and, and death the grave for our sake, for, on our behalf, and, and now you rule and reign on high, and so we celebrate you. I invite you right there in the privacy of your own home to break the bread and drink the cup, and in so doing, celebrate Jesus. Well, friends, that's a wrap. Uh, again, I'm, I'm so thankful, honored that you've invited me into your home. Uh, you know, we're going to be worshiping uh, right here uh, in, in our public space here in, in just a bit, but but you're not ready to get out, and I, I totally respect that. We're going to continue pushing out these, these worship services so that you might worship with us virtually until, until the time comes where you can come and join, and join us in person. Um, if you have any questions about uh, what I preached on today, maybe the Lord's tugging at your heart, and you just want to talk a little, a little bit more about that, you can send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. And I'd love to correspond with you if there's a way that we, that, that we, the elders, the pastors at River Church, can serve you or help you in any way. Just send me that email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. If you have any questions about the church, uh, you can also go to our website, uh, riverchurchrgv.com. And, and you can just study who we are and, and learn more about us, learn about ways that you can get connected, about, about uh, opportunities to, to serve and to be served. We have a virtual schedule that will tell you all the ways that you can get connected here at River Church. Uh, now would be a good time to go online and give. Everything that we do here as a church is based on your good gifts. Many of you give sacrificially every week. Uh, we need a few more of you to, to step up to the plate and to kind of carry the load uh, with your generosity as well. So uh, go to the website and you can give. It's safe. It's, it's intuitive. It's uh, easy. Uh, it's kind of fun. And it's certainly it's, uh, it's, it's quick. So, uh, or you can, you can send in your check as well if you'd rather do that. You can go to our website and see the P.O. box and you can mail your check, your offering to that. Well, I think that's that's everything. Uh, again, thank you for inviting me to your home, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. In the meantime, go to the website and check out what's going on. Check out what, the offerings that we have, and, and go to the website and give. Love you guys. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.